Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for taking time to attend today's installment of the ISFIC webinar series. I'll go ahead and start off with a territory acknowledgement. Uh, we acknowledge and respect the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory the university stands and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and w Wasanach peoples whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. Today, we have a guest that is close to home. He is an alumnus, a mechanical engineer, and industrial mechanic by training, and a bicycle enthusiast by choice. Let me introduce to you Dr. Kevin Palmer Wilson. Kevin is a University of Victoria postdoctoral fellow in search of electrification and renewable gas transition options. His PhD at UVic's Institute for Integrated Energy Systems led him to quantify geothermal energy potentials, land area impacts, and infrastructure requirements of Western Canada's energy transition. Before coming to Victoria, Kevin developed onshore wind farms in Germany, evaluated wind resources for the South Pacific nation of Tonga, and raced a solar-powered car through Australia. I think it is time to get to the show. Kevin is here today to present his research titled Decarbonization of the Building Heating System in Metro Vancouver, Comparison of Two Transition Pathways. And with that, Kevin, I'll give you the floor. Thank you, Jake. That was a great introduction. Um, I'm going to jump right into it. What I'm going to show you today are uh, preliminary results for a project that we've been working on with Fortis BC for the past year. These results are pre preliminary because we are extending this project for another two years uh, in order to really dive deep into uh, the factors that influence the results that we found so far. So without further ado, what I'm going to talk about today are electrification and renewable gas options for decarbonizing the heating sector in Metro Vancouver. And the purpose of this is to really understand the energy system requirements of either of these pathways that are mutually exclusive in our modeling here. Um, so we want to look at what happens if we electrify the heating sector and what happens if we switch the heating sector to use renewable gas. So what I'm going to cover today is uh, the policy motivation around uh, this investigation, then the emissions and the energy demand of Metro Vancouver, the energy demand profiles that we had to create in order to make this investigation work, the model and the scenarios that we developed, and then I'm going to show you some results. So I'm going to compare these two pathways in terms of their capacity and storage requirements, in terms of their costs, and then I'm going to leave you with some takeaways and next steps. I really enjoy this picture of downtown Vancouver. It is a beautiful place uh, to live, and many people seem to think so because Metro Vancouver houses 2.5 million persons, which is 53% of BC's population. And this was a major driver in our decision to uh, model Metro Vancouver. This was uh, driven by data availability, but also the fact that if you can decarbonize Metro Vancouver, uh, we're a good step toward decarbonizing uh, British Columbia as a whole, even though you have to acknowledge that other um, areas, other communities outside of Metro Vancouver will obviously have different needs and different energy demands. But because of the data availability, we focus on Metro Vancouver. The policies are in place to, to motivate this investigation. So British Columbia wants to reduce emissions by 80% by 2050. Metro Vancouver wants to become carbon neutral by 2050. And the city of Vancouver, which is just one of several in the Metro Vancouver area, wants to use 100% renewable energy up from 31% today. So those are quite ambitious goals. And just to be clear, uh, the area that we're talking about here is the Metro Vancouver Regional District as it is defined by Statistics Canada uh, on this map here. So. Uh, Vancouver being here is, is just a small part of the Metro Vancouver Regional District as a whole. If we look at the emissions for 2018, we can see that the residential and the commercial building sector uh, made up about a quarter of the emissions in that year. Um, the transportation sector clearly dominates the emissions and I do have a scenario where uh, we um, include uh, the transportation sector in our modeling analysis here today, um, but we're really focusing on the residential and commercial building sectors by substituting the fossil fuels used in the space heating and the water heating sectors. 
Now, that substitution is uh, a challenge because if you look at the secondary energy contained in the fuels used in the year 2016, in the transportation sector, the liquid fuel uh, energy content uh, clearly dominates. Um, but what I'm showing you here is the space and the water heat uh, demand that was supplied with natural gas. And in comparison to the other electricity demand that excludes space and water heating, that is uh, a quite a substantial amount of energy. Um, now other electricity here excludes uh, space and water heating. So that's uh, appliances, lights, and so on. Um, but part of the space and water heating was already powered by electricity in the year 2016. So what I'm going to show you today is the analysis of replacing this uh, chunk of natural gas here in order to decarbonize. And we do that either with uh, electricity or with renewable gas. Now, electrification obviously increases the demand for energy and for power. But understanding by how much was crucial to this investigation. So. Um, if the natural gas uh, system supplies a, a furnace, then that furnace has a, an efficiency that uh, supplies a certain amount of space heat. So the consumers want space heat. They don't necessarily want natural gas. They want uh, a warm home, and that is defined by the end use energy that they demand. Now, when we switch the conversion technology, when we, when we uh, switch the efficiency of that conversion technology, so if we replace a furnace with a heat pump, obviously um, that heat pump has to supply the am same amount of end use energy, but it uses a different amount of electricity. So uh, we actually did a, a deep dive into the data that was available, um, which is mainly secondary energy consumption and the efficiency of today's conversion technologies to figure out the end use energy demand. But the annual end use energy demands weren't sufficient to make this investigation. What we had to come up with were um, hourly profiles because if we're going to supply additional energy with variable renewables, then we have to have a good understanding of what the hourly demands look like. What I'm showing you here is the net electricity demand for a one year period. So from the hour one to the hour 8,760 for the year 2016 is where we have this data from. And this is net electricity again. So it excludes space and water heating. And that's why this electricity demand curve here is fairly flat um, in, in comparison to uh, uh, on a seasonal basis. The same is true for the water heat demand. The water heat demand does not fluctuate much uh, on a seasonal basis. So it is a little bit lower in the summertime. It's a little bit higher in the wintertime, but it doesn't, it doesn't fluctuate that much. The big um, variability is in the space heat demand, which is obviously much higher in the wintertime here on the ends and much lower in the summertime. Now, the problem that we found was that the year 2016 was not a very cold year. And if we plan our system, we need to plan for um, uh, cold snaps, which means that we have to look at what happens. Can, can the system supply the energy even if it gets very cold? And the way we analyzed this was by going uh, by looking at historical temperature data from the Pitt Meadows Climate Station, which supplied hourly temperature records uh, from 1995 to 2019. And we found that in those data records, the year 1996 had the lowest uh, temperature. It got down to minus 16 degrees in that year, in 1996 in Metro Vancouver. And that year also had the third highest number of heating degree days. So we did a regression analysis of the 2016 space heat demand and essentially subjected Metro Vancouver to the temperature profile that we had uh, recorded in 1996. And we found that this regression analysis delivers a space heat demand curve, which has a much larger peak than the 1996 curve. 
And uh, I'm going to get back to this peak here, which is about a five day period at the end of January, at the beginning of February, um, because this really makes a big difference in the results. Now, if we are to supply additional electricity from the existing hydro system, um, we need to know how much surplus energy and how much surplus surplus capacity the existing uh, hydro system in BC can supply. BC produces about 91% of its electricity from hydropower. Uh, the rest is biomass and wind power is only about 1%. But um, approximately one third of the annual energy supply can be dispatched on a flexible basis. That means two thirds of the annual in water inflows cannot be dispatched fully flexibly. And the reason is that BC, uh, the, the BC hydro system has to um, participate in flood control and is dominated by uh, freshet inflows, freshet water inflows, so snow melt inflows in early summer, which limit the amount of flexible power that uh, the, the system can dispatch. We know that the amount of surplus energy and the capacity can substitute some fossil fuels, but it's it's challenging to figure out really how much. And the reason why this is so challenging is because the different data sources that are publicly available draw different boundaries around uh, their systems. Uh, mainly the BC Balancing Authority uh, boundary is different from BC Hydro's uh, uh, boundary. And I'm trying to show this here, where at the top, this red uh, straight line that you have here is BC Hydro's 2018 effective load carrying capability as per their revenue requirements application. Um, this is just over, over 12 gigawatt that they had available, uh, just under 12 gigawatt that they had available. And the all time peak load from, this is data from 2007 to 2019 where we see here that the all-time peak load at any given time was just under BC Hydro's load carrying capability. Now, the problem here is that this green curve is from the, B, from the BC Balancing Authority. The BC Balancing Authority balances in real time the supply and demand on British Columbia's integrated uh, uh, transmission system. BC Hydro acts as the balancing authority, but BC Hydro is not equivalent to the balancing authority. And um, BC Hydro's uh, uh, load can capability may not actually have to carry all the loads on the integrated system that are included in the balancing authority load. So that makes this, this analysis of how much surplus capacity, how much room do we have between the red and the green curve here that makes this analysis quite challenging. In addition, if you look at the imports and exports here, this is again data between 2007 and uh, 2018, um, we can see that most of the energy is exported in summertime, but there is some exports in wintertime. But again, the documentation doesn't actually say whether imports and exports are included in this peak demand here, in the, in the electricity demand. For the purpose of the study, I'm assuming that BC Hydro's load carrying capability and the provincial load are the same systems, which may not necessarily be the case. So that introduces some uncertainty here. The model that we use, I'm only gonna briefly touch on the model that we use. Um, it's a one year hourly optimization uh, which is a linear capacity expansion and dispatch model that minimizes the total cost. We use a one-year hourly optimization because we assume an overnight conversion. So we're modeling Metro Vancouver as it was in the year 2016. And then we go to an alternate universe where uh, natural gas is replaced with either electricity or renewable gas overnight. So there's no, there's no system transition. We just model the system um, with different starting values, with different constraints. The model has to supply all the energy demands, which in this case are electricity, space heat, and water heat. But it has to do so while replacing natural gas gradually. So in the electrification pathway, it replaces natural gas with electricity. In the 
in the renewable gas pathway. It replaces natural gas first with biogas, but biogas supply is limited, and then with hydrogen when biogas runs out. In order to produce more energy, the system can install wind and solar power if it needs to. It, in, it can install electricity and gas storage, and in, it can install electrolyzers in order to produce more hydrogen. The scenarios that we develop um, are designed to capture the boundaries about around what we think could be a best and a worst case. So they delineate kind of the upper and lower bounds. And we created seven scenarios um, that each distinguish uh, a key feature. Uh, we distinguish between high and low capital costs. So we use cost forecasts for 2030 and for 2050. We distinguish between resource availability. So the amount of biogas supply that's available in BC, we have an upper and a lower bound for that. We also have a scenario with wind and solar variability that, um, that, that is more beneficial and less beneficial. And then uh, in terms of energy demand, we have a, we, we subject the system to the 1996 temperature profile, which has a higher energy demand and the 2016 temperature profile, which has a lower energy demand. And then we do actually have one scenario where we added the transportation demand, electric road transportation demand to both pathways to investigate what happens if several sectors are electrified simultaneously. I'm gonna get into results now. So what I'm gonna show you are several of these kinds of plots. What this shows here, I'm showing you installed capacity for the electrification pathway as the system replaces natural gas from zero to 100%. So what this means is we run the model for the one year period. Essentially, this is the status quo. Here, the model has to replace 0% of the natural gas with other forms of energy. So what we see is the status quo where only hydropower is installed, the existing hydropower system can support the electricity demand. As natural gas is gradually re replaced in 10% increments all the way up to 100%. So in the 100% case, there's no more natural gas being used in the system. In this electrification pathway, 100% of the natural gas is replaced with electricity. And what we see is the hydro capacity stays the same because we're assuming that in BC, we cannot build more hydropower capacity, but the model installs more wind, more solar and more electricity storage. Now, electricity storage can be either battery or pumped hydro storage, that depends on the scenario. Um, but if we compare that to the renewable gas pathway, we see a similar trend. So in the renewable gas pathway, again, 0% of the natural gas has been replaced with the renewable gas here, and 100% of the renewable gas, uh, of the natural gas has been replaced with the renewable gas on this end. And what we see is that ad additional electricity is not needed up to about 30% because uh, there's sufficient biogas available to supplement the the natural gas supply, but then the system needs to install more electricity, solar, and electrolyzers in order to produce additional hydrogen. The whiskers that I'm showing you here is the full range of the top of this bar that we see across all scenarios. So what I'm showing you here are the results for the reference scenario. And these whiskers delineate, this is the kind of the, the best case scenario and this is the worst case scenario for installed capacity across all seven uh, scenarios that we developed. I wanna take a deep dive into the energy capacity because uh, this is the, the largest uh, driver of, of costs um, in our modeling here. And you can see that across all the scenarios, so from the bottom of the whiskers to the top of the whiskers, the electric energy storage capacity, so the size of the batteries or the size of the pumped hydro facilities, ranges from four gigawatt hours to 350 gigawatt hours. And that's a really large range. The reason why this happens is because 
when peak power demand, when peak electricity demand exceeds hydro, BC Hydro's load carrying capability, then storage needs to make up the remainder. And the way this works is I'm showing you here the, the hourly energy production and consumption uh, in this five day peak demand period that I pointed out earlier. So this is the um, energy production from the 29th of January to the 5th of February in the uh, high space heat demand case, where we see um, in blue, the hydro must run and hydro flexible uh, capacity, but the demand actually exceeds hydro's uh, energy production capability. And the top of this stacked area plot is the electricity demand during this time frame, and that's driven by the space heat demand. And what you can see is that beyond hydro's capacity, the model uses wind and solar power and energy storage in order to supply demand. But in, in black here, you see the state of charge of the storage uh, capacity. And you see that after three days, the, the stored energy goes down to zero. Um, and the reason why this happens is because this is enough for the model uh, to supply all the demand because the model has available some solar and wind power. The reason why this happens is because there is, there is some wind and solar power available during this time frame. So the model actually installs large amounts of wind and solar power that produce a little bit of energy during this time frame, but then produce surplus during the rest of the year. And this is a little bit problematic because uh, the the energy system wouldn't wouldn't really be run this way, uh, where we overinstall wind and power wind and solar power drastically. So we created a what we call the resilient scenario, where wind and solar are exogenously made non-available during this time frame, and that's what you see here. Now, the any capacity demand that exceeds hydro's load carrying capability has to supply by storage. And then what happens is the storage capacity gradually declines down to zero. Now notice the different um, axis ranges here. Here, storage starts out in the reference scenario at 80 gigawatt hours. That's the top of this bar. 80 gigawatt hours of storage drains in three days. Now, in order to supply demand during the entire time frame, storage uh, needs to be sized at 350. So the top of this whisker plot is 350 gigawatt hours, and that can supply the demand throughout this peak space heat demand period. Now I really drove down onto the, onto the electric uh, storage capacity here. This is less relevant for the renewable gas pathway because gas storage is much lower cost than electricity storage. So I've cut this, this graph off here. It actually goes up to about a thousand gigawatt hours, the, the, the top of this, the whisker plot here and the gas storage, um, the amount of gas storage needed in the renewable gas pathway. But for comparison, the Aitken Creek gas storage facility in Northeastern British Columbia can store 80,000 gigawatt hours of natural gas, not hydrogen necessarily, but natural gas. Um, so this is something that we that we'll need to refine the, the cost of hydrogen storage. But um, again, gas storage is much lower cost than electricity storage. So this is why I'm, I'm highlighting this storage range here. Now, finally, I want to compare costs. And what I'm showing you here are the annualized costs, which means it's the cost of the of operating the system for a one year period, including the capital costs discounted to a one year period. So we're modeling one year periods, but obviously when the system installs wind and solar power and electricity storage, the lifetime of those technologies exceeds uh, one year. So we discount the cost of those technologies to the one year period to then uh, get the annualized costs and Really what I wanna show you here is the large range of costs that we see in the electrification scenario, in the electrification pathway. 
the cost range is really large. In the renewable gas pathway, this range is smaller. And the biggest cost driver here is this, this peak electricity demand in the electrification pathway. When it exceeds hydro's load carrying capability, that's really what drives storage needs and then costs. In the renewable gas pathway, this is really driven by biogas availability. And um, that, so the amount of biogas available in British Columbia makes a big difference to how costly this whole system is going to be. I should note that the costs that I'm including here in this comparison are only the gas and electricity production and storage costs. I'm not including things like heat air retrofits. So if we switch our uh, heating system from natural gas to hydrogen, um, we would need to uh, uh, deploy hydrogen heaters in, in our homes. And the, the switch from furnaces to hydrogen heaters is not included in these costs. I'm also not including transmission and distribution costs, especially the upgrading. So transporting hydrogen in the natural gas grid is only possible up to a certain percentage um, without upgrades. So the costs of actually switching to 100% hydrogen are not included for the transmission and distribution system here. Just as a comparison between the different pathways, we, so we act uh, between the between the different scenarios. So we actually had these uh, these seven scenarios that we looked at, and the the pathway cost difference that I'm showing you here is the difference between the 100% bar in the electrification scenario and the 100% bar in the renewable gas uh, pathway, sorry, pathway, not scenario. The electrification pathway versus the renewable gas pathway. So the height of this bar, the difference is, is the, the, the pathway cost difference that I'm showing you here. And what this shows is that when there's low heat demand, the electrification pathway is significantly lower cost than the renewable gas pathway. And the reason why this is because in the low heat demand uh, uh, scenario, the existing hydro capacity can support almost all the additional electricity needed in order to um, switch to, to electric heating. But in all other scenarios, the renewable gas pathway is lower cost because storage is lower cost. And um, what this tells us is that we really need to do more analysis around which which uh, scenario assumptions are the that are, are realistic going into the future. Second last slide. What I want to leave you with is first of all that these are preliminary results. So as I mentioned before, we are working on on refining uh, this this work uh, over the next two years, but it's important to see that either pathway can be lower cost. So it's not a clear cut case where either electrification or um, uh, adoption of renewable gas is, is the better option. But we see preliminary at least that the renewable gas pathway has the smaller cost range. This is the big one. The cost drivers are clearly when peak electricity demand exceeds hydro's load carrying capability we need additional storage capacity um, because lack of dispatchable capacity alternatives means it dries up costs. That means that dispatchable capacity has high value for our system. But um, conversely, avoiding a peak demand increase also has high value. So what that means, it may be better to electrify summer peaking sectors first. So for example, the transportation sector may be able to make better use of the surplus energy and surplus capacity um, in order to reduce carbon emissions than the heating sector because uh, the heating sector increases the electricity demand in the winter time when peak demand is already high. These results are really sensitive to the existing capacity. So going forward, we're gonna need to have a better understanding of how much uh, additional peak capacity our system can supply. Uh, so this is really about data availability for British Columbia. Last slide. So our next steps are to improve energy demand assumptions. And this is actually based on um, uh, 
feedback that we got from stakeholders. So I've held this presentation several times uh, with, with various groups of stakeholders, um, including the BC Ministry of Energy and Mines and, and uh, Metro Vancouver policymakers. And feedback that I've gotten was that we really need to look at the heat pump efficiency that we're assuming because heat pumps that are, are coming out now are much more efficient than historic heat pumps. We need to look at building stock turnover and um, energy reduction, energy demand reduction due to the step code efficiency improvements. But we also need to improve our energy supply assumptions. So um, hydropower can in, increase uh, capacity by installing more uh, generators in existing dams. So not building more dams, but um, in, uh, increasing the the power supply, the power capacity of existing dams, including demand response. So demand response doesn't necessarily reduce energy demand, but it does in reduce the peak capacity demand. So that's something we're going to include going forward. And we've been asked to align scenario assumptions with stakeholder comments. So right now we're actually forming a um, steering committee with stakeholders in order to make sure that the analysis going forward is going to be useful for policymakers um, uh, to design our uh, decarbonization policy in Metro Vancouver and, and uh, at a municipal level going forward. We are going to investigate the operation of the coupled electric and gas system in terms of resilience. So that means how does energy demand and supply variability affect our coupled electricity and gas system? And we're going to do a spatial analysis. So where we put the electrolyzers, is it better to put the electrolyzers next to the hydro dams and then transport the hydrogen down to the centers of consumption, which is basically Metro Vancouver, or is it better to upgrade the electricity system, put the electrolyzers in Metro Vancouver rather than upgrading the, the hydrogen um, uh, transmission system? Uh, and, and that will help us to understand uh, how the system will interact depending on where we place the demand and, and supply. Last but not least, uh, we are going to investigate pathways to net zero emissions. So in this system uh, that I showed where even 100% natural gas replacement still has some carbon emissions associated with it. And that means we need to reduce our carbon emissions further. And we want to investigate what does it mean to um, achieve net zero emissions? That means the electricity system will likely have to produce additional electricity to capture air, uh, capture carbon from the air in order to reduce emissions in other sectors. That's it going forward. Um, thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to discuss uh, this, this work. Um, there's, there's a lot going on here, so I look forward to your questions and suggestions as well.